As virtues go, most of us don't think about them too much. What is a virtue, anyway? We may talk about a person's honesty or strength of character, or we may acknowledge that we need to be more patient or truthful in our own lives. But there is one virtue that few of us pay any attention to, and if we do, it's usually in a negative context. What is that virtue? Chastity. Now, please don't switch off, because I hope you'll be surprised by what we can say about this most misunderstood virtue. Just hearing the word chastity makes many uneasy. It conjures up the idea of a prudish attitude towards sex. The word just sounds so old-fashioned and out of touch with life today. But is it? First, we need to clarify that chastity does not mean celibacy. Celibacy means that an individual, for whatever reason, chooses to refrain from any and all sexual activity. It's an individual choice, made for an individual reason. Chastity, on the other hand, is a virtue for all. Human sexuality calls out for a structure of personhood upon which to grow, blossom, and bear fruit. According to Cicero, the goddess of chastity, Diana, was known not only as Lucifera, the light-bearer, but also as Omnivaga, or roaming everywhere, sovereign and free. So where does the word chastity come from? The Latin castus and the Greek katharos mean pure. From the Greek katharos, we also get catharsis. Now think about that for a moment. What do we mean when we talk about catharsis or a cathartic moment? It can mean a purging of emotions through evocation of pity or fear, as in tragedy, or bringing repressed ideas or experiences to consciousness. Catharsis is about bringing to light or out of the depths of a person that which is most true, most sincere, most authentic of their personhood. Chastity, therefore, is a marker of integrity, of a personality whose parts are assembled in harmonious completeness. Cicero, in his On Divination, says it is unlikely a man will grasp the signified meaning of phenomena unless his soul, animus, is chaste and pure. By this he intends lucid open-spiritness, a freedom from passionate bias. Taking this further, in the first Tusculan Disputation, Cicero cites Socrates and outlines two ways in which human beings may leave this life. Those blinded by vice, the debauched or profligate, the selfish politicians, will have erred from the goodness and beauty of the gods and be unfit to enjoy their fellowship forever. Such people, he says, have come to dread death's hour. Those, meanwhile, who have kept themselves chaste and entire, not reducing existence to self-indulgence, but keeping their minds in ascent, may look forward to beatitude hereafter. To be chaste in this life is to attune oneself to celestial life, and so to have reason to die, says Cicero, like a swan with singing and desire. To be unchaste is to corrupt the elegance of a coherent whole by introducing elements not connatural to it. As Eric Varden says, for one thing, chastity is not a denial of sex. 
it is an orientation of sexuality, of the whole vital instinct towards a desired finality. It is a function of wholeness sought and healing found. It matters to one who would be chaste to have a clear idea of motivating purpose. If you look at the Germanic roots of the word chastity, such as kush, quis, or kisk, you'll see that their origin lies in the Gothic term kuskais, which is derived from the Latin conscious. In this sense, chastity supposes first a conscious awareness of the good, whole, and pure, then a will to construct one's life by these values. Over the years, however, the word chastity has lost its vision as a maturing view to flourishing and fruitfulness, and in a Christian sense, with a view to glory. For the Christian life is life oriented towards beatitude. How did this happen? Appeasement. The Christian discourse of the past several centuries narrowed and redefined the Christian understanding of chastity. It lost sight of the classical and early Christian understanding given to us by the church fathers and mothers. Somehow the genuine and true meaning of chastity got divorced from its true meaning, and we have been suffering from this alteration for several centuries. It really has messed up many people's minds and lives. A genuine Christian view of chastity embraces the complex fullness of our human condition, no less than the divine fulfillment to which we are called. The Christian view of what it is to be sexual, and so, by extension, what it is to be chaste, presupposes a particular view of what it is to be human. A good word to help understand the place and virtue of chastity in our lives is balance. In our life's journey, we are moving toward equilibrium, a rich and full life that embraces both the spirit and the flesh. If we live in the world chastely, we have become contemplatives because we see ourselves and humankind truthfully. If our aim is to live a chaste life, it does not mean killing our nature. Rather, it requires a reorientation towards fullness of life. What is our image of ourselves? Do we think of ourselves as made in the image and likeness of God, as it says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, where God says, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. We know that God has no image, so what's going on? How can a human being embody God's image? As Rabbi Jonathan Sachs remarked, image must refer to something quite different from the possession of a specific form. The fundamental point of Genesis 1 is that God transcends nature. Therefore, he is free, unbounded by nature's laws. By creating human beings in his image, God gave us a similar freedom thus creating the one being capable itself of being creative. The early church fathers, especially those from the Syriac tradition, saw a further ontological dimension in this formula. They found in it a statement of what human beings have in them to become. They were keen to make biblical sense of what the word image might really stand for. Vladimir Losky writes in his book, In the Image and Likeness of God, that, quote, 
For the theologian of the Catholic tradition in the East and in the West, for one who is true to the main lines of patristic thought, the theme of the image in its twofold acceptance, the image as the principle of God's self-manifestation, and the image as the foundation of a particular relationship of man to God, must belong to the essence of Christianity. Romano Guardini also gives prominent place to this idea of the image in his book, Essence of Christianity. Unquote. For both East and West, the image ceases to be an abstraction. It comes to designate a presence. To be human is to exist with a sense of an absence to be fulfilled. Only in the light of our human substances longing for union with the divine do our lesser yearnings make sense. We know what it means to be living in the shadow of death, but we also know that by virtue of the mercy shown us, the virtue of faith-filled hope, that we are also robed in glory, even though at the same time we have no idea of how being restored by redemptive grace in eternal life will look like in the end. It's like saying we do not know what is natural to us, so we struggle to live naturally. If we continue to build our lives on a merely empirical basis, we will carry on mistaking what is provisional for that which endures. This will manifest itself in certain tensions that will mark our quest for effective and sexual integrity, that is, for chastity. One who is created in the image is a person capable of manifesting God in the extent to which his nature allows itself to be penetrated by deifying grace. Thus the image, which is inalienable, can become similar or dissimilar to the extreme limits, that of union with God, when deified, man shows in himself by grace what God is by nature, or that of the extremity of falling away, which Plotinus called the place of dissimilarity, placing it in the gloomy abyss of Hades. These are the two extremes between which the personal destiny of man may veer in the working out of his salvation, which is already realized in hope for everyone in the incarnate image of the God who willed to create man in his own image. Chastity enables us to live attentively and reverently. It is a way of being alive in the world. A chaste mind will inform our interactions. It will shape our actions as well, the way we live, every aspect of our lives, from eating and drinking to opening and closing doors. To live a chaste life, to be chaste in all your dealings with yourself and with others, is to recreate that harmony between who you are and who you are becoming. Chastity is living a life in union with God. It doesn't get more simple or more profound than that. Thanks very much for watching. I hope you have enjoyed this video. And if you did, please consider leaving a like and possibly subscribing. God bless.